Welcome to San Diego Comic-Con at Home 2021 for IDW Publishing's Comics Kitchen panel. I'm your hostess, Nikki Hendry, and I'm also known as that hangry girl. Uh, with me today, we have James Albon, who's an author and artist of The Delicacy. Hi, James. Round of applause for you. Yeah, thank and you very Edgar much. <laughs> welcome welcome and we're so excited to have you and also edgar camacho author and artist of the onion skin round of applause for you as well um Hi, both of these delicious new graphic novels from top shelf are available right now so obviously james edgar you guys know all of 2020 has been over zoom at home in our couch in sweatpants and we've all been talking heads on zoom so we're going to do something fun and different today uh, while we're having our, our interview, I'm going to interview you guys about both of your graphic novels. We are going to um, do something fun. I'm going to cook and you guys are going to cook the dish that I'm or you guys are going to draw the, the dish that I'm cooking. So in real time, we are going to be making beef and mushroom enchiladas. Edgar, I have to ask you, have you ever had a Mexican dish with mushrooms in it? Yes. A lot of dishes. Really? Yeah. I'm done with mushrooms. And a lot of soups, you know, like uh, there is a, one particular that is called Aztec soup. That is just like a lot of mushroom, tortilla, fried tortilla, and chili. Ooh. You know, it's really Ooh. good. Nice. And James, mushroom is the biggest thing in your book, uh, the delicacy. So please tell me what your favorite dish is with mushrooms. Well, writing the delicacy came from a funny place for me because I actually don't like mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, my, my sort of dislike for them was actually the kind of jumping off point. I wanted to write something about a food that I kind of felt I had a strong reaction to, but the reaction was kind of disgust. So um, writing the book came from a strong place for me, but I'm not a mushroom man at all. Well, neither am I, but mushrooms was a big thing in your book and Mexican food was a big thing in your, your book, Edgar. So we are going to make those beef and mushroom enchiladas. So you guys want to get started? All yeah. right, let's go. Let's do this. All right, so... First, I'm going to add some beef into the skillet to brown it. All right, so Edgar, let's start with you. Please tell everyone where you're from and what kind of, kind of comics you like to draw. Uh, I am from Mexico the southern neighbor of the United States. In, in general, I draw a lot of everyday life, you know? I like to do a lot of action scenes too, and a lot of superhero things, but in general, my work is about everyday life. So that's the kind of work I like to do, you know? A lot of slice of life and, and a lot of uh, funny comics, funny comic stripes, you know? Okay, I love that. Um, then James, where are you from and what kind of comics do you like to draw? Uh, so I'm from Edinburgh in Scotland and um, I think similarly to Edgar, I really like drawing from life. A big part of my work is uh, going out with a sketchbook and going to cafes and restaurants and bars and, you know, just drawing life as I see it directly from, uh, from observation and then taking those sorts of characters and those situations that I've seen and putting them into graphic novels. So writing a graphic novel with me about a restaurant was really exciting because I love restaurants and it's such a big part of, you know, my, my personality and my interests uh, that it was a great world to explore and get into more detail in writing about. Yes, I love that. So James, you talk about your book, um, you know, being uh, about mushrooms, but please tell us about the main characters, you know, um, and why, why did they start working with food? So the two characters in the book are a pair of brothers um, called Tulip and Rowan, who've moved from a kind of small remote island on the west coast of Scotland uh, and have moved to the big city of London with the intention of starting a restaurant. Um, their relationship with food is that Rowan is a farmer, and a market gardener, and so lives close to the soil, believes in organic produce and using his own hands to grow vegetables. Um, Tulip is an ambitious cook, so when they open their restaurant together, the plan is that uh, Rowan will grow the vegetables and then Tulip will cook these amazing, uh, these amazing meals in this restaurant. They sort of see Scottish cooking as being wholesome and organic and authentic. And they're hoping to bring it to London with the intention of sort of overpowering the world of fast food and the world of, um, uh, you know, processed food and what they see as sort of polluted, corrupted culture around food. 
So that's their sort of high-minded ambitions when they go to London. Although when they get into it, it doesn't entirely go as planned. No, no, it doesn't, James. There's a huge plot twist in your book. I can't even oh, wait yeah. to get to talk about that in a little bit. Um, so just so you guys know, I added some chopped up white mushrooms and some um, white onion into the mix. Also, um, Edgar, your book is about, you know, the burger truck uh, and the spices that go into your meals. Um, I have a spice mix made of cumin, paprika, some uh, ground chili powder, uh, as well as some um, little other spices. That's a secret. <laughs> yeah. but uh edgar tell us tell us about your book the main characters in your book and why they started to get you know involved with food yeah my, my book has is two main characters rolando and nera and rolando is a square guy who follows every every rule you know he's just like a boring guy who goes to a boring office job and nera is the opposite of him nera is always looking for something to complete her and one of her dreams is to cook, you know, have, having a life cooking around the, the entire country. So with Rolando, when they meet each other, they change their life forever and take a step into the into the void, you know, like there's to do something that never done and enjoy it along the way, even if they don't have to cook, you know, because yeah. they don't know how to do it. It's just like an adventure, like, oh, it would be great if I just go and become a, a, a chef of a food truck. And that's that's the way of, of all the book, you know, like take the first step to do something you want to do without knowing if you're going to su succeed. That is very interesting you say that because that was a, a an overall theme in your book that they both didn't know how to cook yet. They were running a food truck together and they wanted to run away and like do this whole big business with the food truck, but neither of them know how to cook. So it yeah. was definitely interesting. <laughs> it's a good metaphor, you know, like the truck is abandoned and roasted like the main character, like Rolando. And with Nera, they fix it and start moving with the food truck along the way. So it's a good metaphor, you know, like finding something that is that it has to need to be fixed and then fix it on the way and enjoy it all the ride, you know, I think is the, that's the, 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 the whole story in the book, you know, enjoy the ride, even if you don't have success on it, you know, if you like to cook, go, go, go ahead and do it. If you like to draw, do comics, doesn't matter if, if you think you are good or, or not, it's just take a, a step forward and, and do it. So you guys in both books, both of your main characters obviously have an amazing success with the food business, but their successes do create some problems. So Edgar, please tell us what is with that biker gang in your book? Uh, it's just like, you know, in, in, in every business, when someone is successful just by the night of the, you know, just one, one day to another, there is always someone who would not like it. In my book, uh, Motorcycle Gang has a monopoly of food trucks. You know, the Motorcycle Gang is treated by this business growth uh, of Rolando and Nera, and they decide to finish, to finish it because it's not uh, in their world, there is no healthy competition. You know, it's just like, we, are, we rule the food around here and who are these guys that will appear from nowhere? That's why the motorcycle gang goes for them. Yeah, tries to sabotage them and their success. It was an, it was it was interesting how you weaved that in there. James, please tell me about Tulip's collapse, his psychological collapse, his desperation, his pressure that he was feeling. I need to know all about him because your book was insane. It was so lovely story about these two brothers and all of a sudden a plot twist. Well, well, it's something that happens to all of us, you know. When you become a millionaire, as constantly happens to me, you suddenly don't know what you what to do. You're <laughs> punished by your own success. There's en 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 kind of endless pressure to uh, perform better for your clients, and you end up betraying your family and destroying everything you love. Hasn't that happened to you? <laughs> I wish I could say I was a millionaire, but no, I feel you on the pressure. And especially when you're in a business with a sibling or a family member, you feel like they're always going to be there for you. And sometimes they just reach their breaking point. Yeah, I think for me as well, it was very important to have this idea that they start out with this really high minded sort of moral goal. They want to 
bring wholesome organic food uh, that in a way is kind of uncompromising and is locally produced and is, uh, you know, has all these virtues to it. And then when Tulip becomes richer and richer and more and more successful, he starts to realize, oh, wait, if I cut corners, there'll be even more wealth for me. There'll be even more pressure to expand. You know, a small local market garden can sustain enough, perhaps enough produce for one small restaurant. But if you want to open a chain, if you want to open internationally, he starts getting this pressure to open branches in New York or Tokyo or Los Angeles. And it's that pressure that makes him compromise his morals more and more and more as the story goes on. It, it was, it, I, your book was uh, interesting. I didn't even know I was reading through 300 pages because it went that quickly. Like it was, it was constant action here and there. Um, uh, all right. So what I'm going to roll the tortillas with is actually corn tortillas. Um, do you guys like corn or flour when you have Mexican food? Edgar? Yeah, it's uh, a lot of uh, food is based on corn, you know, and there are uh, many types of tortillas. The blue ones, the yellow ones, oh. white ones. Yeah, and flour, you know, like more heavy in the yeah. north. More just like, do like they a mainly, burrito. Like, do, yeah, like burritos, right? With flour yeah. more, more so? Yeah. yeah. What about you, James? Well, I have another embarrassing secret to share, which is that I've never eaten enchiladas. What? <laughs> I think in, in a way, this is an interesting thing about it. I know we'll talk a little bit more about sort of food and culture and nationality in a bit, but um, there's not a lot of Mexican food in Britain, actually, you know, because of these histories of sort of uh, immigration and diaspora and colonialism. There's not a big Mexican population in, uh, in Britain, obviously, in the same way that there is in, um, you know, the south of the United States, especially. And yeah. so while... London is incredible for cosmopolitan food that's come from, say, East Asia, South Asia, mainland Europe. We don't have a lot of uh, uh, we don't have a lot of Mexican food here. And I actually asked a friend of mine, a Mexican friend of mine in London, oh, can you recommend any restaurants? Where should we go? I really want to try some some good Mexican food. And she flatly said to me, there are no good authentic restaurants in London. <laughs> what? That is so that may be unfair, but she claimed that uh, <laughs> she claimed that I could not find authentic Mexican food in London. So this is uh, as much a learning experience for me as anything else watching you cook this. Wow. So interesting. Talk about a coincidence that both of you guys' books were centered around food. So James, I know you said a little bit about why you're, how you got started in this, but could you please, you know, repeat, you know, why you guys decided to make this book about food when you don't even like mushrooms? Well, I think for me, I mean, although I'm not a big fan of mushrooms, I love gastronomy and I love restaurants and cooking in general. I think it's such an interesting world because it's, um, it combines obviously something we need to do to live. Eating is such a fundamental part of just being alive. But at the same time, we have a world of fine dining where we've dressed it up as this hugely complex cultural thing that means so many different things about who we are, who we want to be in society, what we aspire to be, where we come from. So I think exploring that sort of tension between cooking being something that's very every day and eating being something that's very every day and then contrasting that with this world that's sort of glamorous and extremely wealthy and extremely high pressure uh, for me is just such an interesting situation to explore and it's such a fertile ground for finding really interesting character dynamics and interesting tensions between characters so um, that was a big part of the inspiration other than that it was just the the love of food you know as I say despite not being a fan of mushrooms um, just before I started uh, working on this book, I was living in Lyon in France, which is like the great French gastronomic city. So we had no shortage of really good options for going out and eating like amazing French food when we were there in Lyon. Wow, that's interesting. And Edgar, what about you? Why did you decide to write a book about food? Draw it as well. Yeah, it's just the same thing. You know, I love food and I love the flavors and the enjoyment, you know, that it means to share food with someone you love. Because here in Mexico, it's it's very traditional when you eat to sit in a big table with all the family and you know the grandma, the grandchildren, and that's 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 what I love about food because bring people together. And here in every occasion, you know, like Dia de Muertos is like a Day of the Dead. You know, like yeah. we we put food to our to the people who are no longer with us, you know, and every we are always eating things here, you know, and <laughs> every social uh, interaction has to do with food mostly. So that's why I, I want to tell a story about that. 
yeah, I mean, I say it often. Food is a love language and it brings people together. But I'm seeing Edgar, yours looks so good. You're drawing. Tell us about what you have on top. Is that cheese or what'd you throw on top? Yeah, I think some cheese and like a little vegetables. I don't know if, if, if like here we put some lettuce on it, you know. Oh. And the recipe, I don't know if you have like uh, avocado and okay. some, you know, uh, pumpkins, chop, chopping pumpkins, you know, something like that, you know. And, and I'm doing with cheese and some uh, melted cheese, cheese and cream. Nice. All right. What about you, James? Yours is very colorful already. Well, yeah. Well, I'm just I'm just laying down the ingredients just as you are, Nikki. I'm just um, you know we've got some beef, we've got some chopped onions up here, some mushrooms going down, uh, and I'll look at how to wrap them up when I see when I'm just see how you do it. Yep, you know. I'm gonna do that like right here if you can see where I'm pointing right here. Yeah. So that's where I'm gonna start wrapping them. For me, I think um, I always like to approach drawing, both drawing and writing, actually. Um, by laying down the biggest strokes first, you know, laying down big areas of color and then adding in the details. And I think in a way cooking can be a bit like that, that you, you know, you start off with your beef and you start off with your chopped onions as these big bold flavors that are sort of underpin the dish. And then you become more and more precise as the spices go in and the herbs go in. I think there's an interesting parallel between those two uh, activities. Yes, there is. Um, there's a huge connection between food and life as well, you guys, um, you know, food, you know, there's an old cliche, you are what you eat. <laughs> so, um, James, tell us about, you know, the connection between food and life in your, in your book. You know, I know you spoke a little bit on about like the tulips character, but tell us a little more. Well, I really like the, as I mentioned, the connection between sort of what food represents as a, as a social commodity. You know, this idea that you can make a statement about whether you're, you know, wealthy or the sort of life you want to aspire to. And there's a certain glamour associated with restaurants and with fine dining culture, especially in a, a big cosmopolitan city like London, there's almost a bit of a sort of one-upmanship of who can discover the most exotic restaurant or the most sort of offbeat food that um, becomes the next big hit. So that's a big part of it for me. And that sort of combination of glamour, but also in a way sort of fads and, and sort of unsubstantial trends in contrast to uh, wholesome organic food and family food and the food that we eat day to day with our friends and our family and the, the food that kind of is a fundamental thing rather than a rather than a sort of showy flashy thing um, I think also as the the plot twist of the book uh, builds up to I do find there's something quite funny about the everydayness of food that it is just ordinary matter that we find in our lives that we meet or we eat uh, vegetables we eat things that have just come straight out of the soil and then we ourselves, in a horrifying way, are also made of meat. Right, exactly. <laughs> and Edgar, what about you? I know you said food brings people together. Yeah, and I use food as a metaphor to express that we are like ingredients that give flavor to the lives of other people and vice versa, you know? It's like we right. are not entirely complete without the other person and vice versa. We, we bring the flavor of their lives and, and they bring some flavors too to our own. So I think that's what I talk in, in my book. It's like a, like a good recipe, you know, it's like you add some sugar to, uh, to something that is a very uh, salt dish, you know, like, why do you going to do that? But it's part of the recipe and the result is unexpected and delicious. Right, exactly. So how long, Edgar, did it take you to, to, to draw your book? How long? It was like, uh, like three months or less, you know, because it three was, months. Yeah, that's so fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. It, it was because it won a, a prize here in Mexico. And the deadline for the delivery of the book, it was so rushed. So I, I it runs, what prize did it win? What? What prize did it win? Uh, it's the National Young Award of Graphic Novel here in Mexico. My gosh, congratulations. That's so exciting. Yeah, thank you. But it was crazy, you know, just delivering the book in time. It was just yeah. a, a good school to make comics. <laughs> And James, what about you? How long did it take you? Clearly not as fast as Edgar. No, wait, like two and a half years. 
really what? long time. <laughs> oh my I god! It, I worked on it for so long, and there's so much. Even just drawing out the pages is sort of I have a, I have a routine, and I try and get up and efficiently get through drawing two finished pages a day. But before I even start on that, there's a year of research and drawing out roughs and developing the ideas for the script and all these different elements that sort of take uh, lots and lots of sort of slow, careful planning. There's a lot of thinking about something and then thinking, oh, is that the right path for the story to go down or should it be uh, should it be adjusted? Should it be changed? Um, which again, I, in a way, almost goes to this uh, similarity, this metaphor of a similarity between cooking and drawing where as you cook, of course, you should taste while you're cooking and have an impression of the the dish as it develops. And I think that, uh, you know, there's a similar thing for me when I'm developing the script or when I'm developing these different, um, uh, these different visual ideas where I want to sort of put the, put the work down on the paper, but then take a step back and think, is that really working? Does it need to be adjusted? And so the process is quite slow and reiterative in a way. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of you doing like the repetition of like putting it down, does it work? The research you did for this because you don't like mushrooms, like how did, is that why it took you two and a half years also to draw it? Is because <laughs> you had to do all of these research on organic foods and yeah, every night I'd sit down in front of a plate of mushrooms and try and eat one, and I go like, oh <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, but I did. I, I read a lot about cooking. I read a lot about the history of particularly um, sort of haute cuisine French cooking. Um, I went to um, some friends of mine who work in restaurant industry or like own restaurants. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to go into their kitchens and do painting, like drawing from life, uh, drawing their, their cooks, working directly in the kitchen, which was really interesting. Um, I bombarded them with hundreds of questions, uh, you know, and I read a lot of, as well, which is a big part of, a very useful uh, part of research for me. So um, that was a lot of the sort of research size of things, which really gave me a huge new appreciation for the hard work that everyone in the restaurant industry works at. Yeah, I that that's funny because I have to I, full disclosure, I'm not a huge mushroom fan either. But because it was such a big hit in your book, I felt like I needed to do a recipe that was a, a, an honor to both you guys' books. But um, Edgar, I have to ask there the, the truck you have, the food truck for your main characters. It's a burger truck. It's a, it's a, yeah, like chili dogs, all that stuff, you know, like very like fries, you know, and eat. Mm, patatas you know it's all like a, like a very uh, american stereotype you know in in a in a good way you know like the chili the chili burger the fries i, I love of that, that kind of food you know you do you love the americanized burger and fries huh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> the first thing i did when i was to united states in the san diego comic con in 2015 was eating a chili dog you know because I see a lot of movies, a lot of uh, uh, man versus food programs, and, and that's what like, I want to eat that thing, you know, that uh, American, so American thing. And that, that was, seven uh, foot burger with four patties and all the stuff yeah. in between. That's what you <laughs> <Yeah>. like. <laughs> with a lot of fries, you know, like they give you a lot of fries. I, I bought a burger and a dollar of fries, and it was just like this, you know, like a really pile of fries. And I will, I love that, you know, I don't know if. It was just a stereotype, but it was delicious, you know. And I think a lot of Mexican food, you know, like enchiladas, tacos, there are a stereotype too, but they are delicious. So what what you can say about that, you know, to like enjoy, enjoy all the the different kind of food. Uh, I love that. All right, you guys. So I have them rolled. Now I'm going to put the sauce and cheese on top. So it's going to be red sauce. All right. So what goes into red sauce? It's a, uh, it's a mysterious name. Red sauce, it's a mysterious name. It's red enchilada sauce because enchiladas can be uh, either verde, which is green sauce, or it can be okay. the red sauce. Okay. And it's different. Yeah. These are just gonna be mild. They're not gonna be hot. I don't do spicy. My husband does though. He loves jalapenos on everything and hot sauce. So it's kind of like I have to meet him in a happy medium. I'm like, here, put your sauce on the side. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm gonna put some cheese on top and then we'll pop these babies in the oven for a few and they will melt. And you guys, and then we can look at your drawings more in depthly when we do that. So. Yeah. All right. Here they are in case you guys want to see them more closely. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, they look great. 
Oh, thank you so much, Edgar. That is a very nice compliment coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to lay down some red sauce on here as well. <laughs> All right. Well, let me pop yeah. these in, give you guys a beat. All right, guys, let's get back to your books. What do you think the most exciting scene of each of your books? You can only choose one. Edgar, you want to go first? Yeah, I think my one of the scenes that I like the most is just at the beginning where there is the motorcycle gang and Nera and Rolando are escaping in the food truck and there are no dialogue on, on all that scene. So I think that's my favorite scene. And as it's like, it's my, I think it's one of the very exciting, you know, like it's reflects the whole mood of the, of the entire book. Yeah, it definitely, it was interesting because you don't start off with any, like, no text. It's all just your yeah. photos and they're running into the sunset trying to get away from the biker gang. So it was interesting because I was like, what is this book about? You know, it says onion skin. I don't, I don't know. So it was, a, it was a good lead in. That was a good lead up. James, what about you? One scene. <laughs> you got a oh, lot. Well, I don't, I don't want to give too much away, but, um, you know, when you have to bury a body in the woods, something dramatic has happened. So... Uh... <laughs> There's a scene, oh. there's a scene, suffice to say, where, um, you know, Tulip thinks, well, things are going OK. You know, the restaurants sort of got off to a good start. They're reasonably successful. Everything's going fine. They're making a good amount of money. You know, he's he's cracked the business. And then very, very quickly, calamity strikes and he ends up with a dead body on his hands. And there's this moment of panic, which um, uh, certainly if you listen to as much uh, sort of true crime podcasts as I do, you, always end, you end up imagining, you know, what? What, what would I do in that situation? You know, a lot of these people who end up in this like disastrous, calamitous situation don't have any expertise to get out of that. And what do you do if you suddenly find yourself with a dead body? So um, I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, there's, it's useful to have a farm, I suppose. It's useful to have someone who knows how to dig holes in the soil and bury things. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is true. Um, so what was your favorite part to draw in your book? Again, one thing. James? start with you mm, for me I think I really enjoyed from a visual sense drawing the uh drawing the restaurants during these big expansive uh, sort of luxurious places I really love drawing crowds I love drawing lots and lots of characters so having this big space where there's uh you know you can have beautiful decor inside you can put in dozens and dozens of people all eating and all eating these sort of uh extravagant sort of over-the-top meals was really really fun those are the those are pages where I would sit back and, you know, really take my time on them and really sort of uh, drink in every minute of the sort of creative process of that drawing. So um, for me, that's the bit where I'm most excited when I'm drawing. Yeah. Edgar? Uh, I think uh, one of the, uh, the things I like to draw here was uh, the food, mainly and the scenes uh, without dialogue, you know, I, I think that's the way I express myself better with the drawing and writing. So I love all the scenes that have no dialogue. And that's why my favorite parts of the book and my other comics too, you know, like these scenes that, that set the mood of the entire book, but doesn't have any dialogue. I think that's... Yeah. yeah. I think as, as graphic novelists, we're very lucky to sort of be able to express that skill of telling a story without words. And it's quite nice to, to sort of have the creative control over your process to be able to just, uh, you know, uh, make something beautiful, but also serves a narrative purpose and really indulge your drawing without having to rely on words. I, you know, I really admire the way you did that in your book. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have to hand it to both of you guys. I don't read graphic novels often. And when I got asked to do this panel for you guys, I read both of you guys' books in their entirety. And I have to admit, I may be now into graphic novels because for me, I fall asleep every time I try to read more than like one chapter of a book. So I may just have to slip through the pages and read the story via pictures. Maybe that's my, maybe you guys just inspired me to be more of like reading yeah. graphic novels now. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> when, so, when, I was, um, um, when I was living in France, I basically learned to speak French by just reading graphic novels because you've always got a picture there to tell you what's going on. Well, <laughs> I love that. Um, so you guys inspired me to read more graphic novels, but who are some of you guys's, you know, inspirations, you know, or movies, novels that had influences on when you guys, you know, not only became graphic novelists, but for these books specifically? Um, I think for me, I was really inspired by um, the best graphic novel about food 
that I'd read was Chicken with Plums by Marjan Satrapi, who's the same author as uh, the same author who wrote Persepolis. Um, so that was really a really enjoyable story about family and food um, that really resonated with me. Um, but I also read a lot of, you know, I enjoyed a lot of food. There's a great film called The, uh, the Delicatessen by Jean-Pierre Junet. Um, and there's a really interesting book about the um, French restaurant system and the Michelin star system uh, mm -hmm. called The Perfectionist by Rudolf Chelminski. So those were really big influences on my process. All right, That's Edgar. Great. Yeah, um, in, on my part, it was a lot of, of Japanese comic, uh, manga and anime, you know, like it's not like a specific title, but I love how how Japanese uh, drawing the food in the scene in their stories, you know, like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Hayao Miyazaki, with Ghibli, mm. Studio Ghibli, like uh, Spirit Away, you know, that kind yeah. of movie where everything looks delicious, you know, ramen, beef, and that's kind of uh, the world that I like and I'm inspired of, and, and a lot of Japanese comic and anime, you know, how they draw the everyday life and food mm. is just impressing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> is there anything you guys want to tell everyone about your books? Anything? You know, you guys are the authors. You guys are the, you know, the artists. Uh, I think, I hope they like it and enjoy it and, <laughs> and eat eat a lot, <laughs> a lot of enchiladas and Mexican food when they are reading it. It, it would be great. No, I don't know. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I just really, I hope people um, read the book and enjoy it, really. I definitely, I definitely feel personally, you know, with this year of, uh, or 18 months now of pandemic, we've, everyone's had a really tough year. And it's been especially difficult on people in the restaurant industry, you know, anyone who's works in a kitchen or works as a waiter or anything has had a very, certainly in the UK, and I imagine it's been difficult in the US as well, you know, it's had a really tough time. So um, I hope that even if, you know, not everyone can necessarily go to restaurants and not ne everyone necessarily feels safe uh, going out to restaurants, depending on what the COVID rate is like in your area, uh, you know, I hope that people can enjoy this book and at least feel a little nostalgia for the time when we could just freely waltz around in restaurants and bars and, uh, you know, eat and drink. Yeah, that, that would be nice. Yeah. Wow, so that looks amazing, Nikki. Yeah. Put your finishing touches. I also added some rice, and I'm going to add some cilantro flakes, dried cilantro flakes, and some avocado as well on top. All right. Okay. So I'll give you a better look, uh, James, if you can see. Yeah, wow, that looks fantastic. Yeah, it looks great, you know. So I'll add some uh, cilantro myself. <laughs> yes. It's a, con it's a controversial it choice though, isn't it? A lot of people don't like it. And it depends on if you use fresh or if you use dried flakes. I prefer okay. dried flakes when I'm making um, some dishes because it's, it's very hard to chop cilantro. Am I right, mm. Edgar? Yeah. <laughs> You need a lot of skills because it's so tiny and you need a bit, a really good knife to do it. Mm -hmm. It's very tiny and it's a spice that doesn't like cut well without a sharp knife. You're right. Mm. <clears throat> All right. So did you guys, you guys think you're going to become a better cook after drawing these books or the, this dish? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> do you guys cook at all? Do you go, do you cook, James? Yeah, we. I mean, we, during the pandemic, when everything was yeah, closed, I mean, did you we, cook? Yeah, certainly. Even before the pandemic, actually, I cooked a lot. Though all the research and all the work for this book really actually gave me a a greater impression of you know made me even more impressed by um, the skills of people who cook professionally. You know, it's the it's such a different world from cooking at home because of the sheer volume that you often have to cook. It's one thing to cook a meal for you know, four people or something. And it doesn't matter if you're a bit late and you've got all the time in the world to prep, but people who work in restaurants and are, you know, chopping a hundred onions while sorting something else, it really blows my mind how much, uh, how much skill and speed they're able to work with. So uh, it's given me a lot of respect for people who work in the restaurant industry. 
I fully agree with that. I mean, I'm an amateur self-taught cook. I just cook basically for me and my husband, but I'm telling you, it's hard. The multitasking and the, you got to exactly like what you said, taste it while you're going and making sure you're not overcooking something. It's hard. So definitely the restaurant industry, um, you know, probably hit really hard during the pandemic, but I hopefully they can bounce back, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Edgar, what about you? Do you cook? Yeah, I actually, one of my favorite dish to cook is enchiladas. Enchiladas berries. Really? Yeah. Yay. <laughs> well, thank you for saying these are, these look good. So here's yeah. my final yeah. dish. I took it out of the, the pan, but you guys, wow, spot on there, Edgar. <laughs> yeah, I think I have hungry now. James, that is so true to your book, how you draw. Yeah, you here we go. Everything. So I'll hold it up a little bit to get a better, get a better angle. Yeah. We've got all the ingredients going straight in there. Oh, everything. And then that yeah, final yeah. dish is in the middle. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we've got a bit of uh, beef there in the middle, the um, julienne onions uh, just above. Uh, red sauce all around. We've got the tortillas down here. Mushrooms uh, just sneaking up here. A little bit of uh, cilantro just along the top. <laughs> Yeah, you definitely never had enchiladas before, but no, no, that's no. okay. <laughs> I, I realize it needs to be somewhat more rolled up. <laughs> no, it's great. It's so interesting how drastically different both of you guys' is, and even mine uh, are from each other. It, it's insane. Yeah. We all did yeah. it together in real time. It's, it's very interesting. <laughs> wow, I can't believe how me and Edgar are so spot on, though. Good job, Edgar. I did you <laughs> proud. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I just want right, to well, grab some of that enchilada, you know? I know. And I want to start making the enchiladas on James's because he's got all the ingredients just laying there for me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the first ever IDW comics kitchen. We hope you guys enjoyed this tasty panel. If you head over to idwpublishing.com, you can download a special comics kitchen sampler that includes extended previews of both of these graphic novels, you got onion skin and the delicacy. So um, you also will get the recipe that I developed for this panel. So thank you both to Edgar and to James. This was so much fun. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Well, thanks so much. <laughs>